having me on this, guys. Um, I'm going to uh, be talking. My name's Tristan. I'm one of the uh, regs at Sutherland Hospital. And I'm going to be talking about this question of diagnostic accuracy in the, in the ED. And the subtitle for my talk is, uh, are we any better than a blindfolded monkey throwing darts? Which has been a question playing on my mind for some time. And I thought I'd try and answer it uh, with all of you guys uh, today. So I'd like you to first just think about a few questions um, and I'll get the people in the room with me at Sutherland to just raise their hands if they agree with the, the following statement. So the first question is, is it important to be accurate at making diagnoses? So just hands up if you think that's true. Uh, no, no tricks here. So yeah, everyone's put their hand up. The next question is, is it important to know how accurate we are? Do you guys think that's true? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the third question is, is, is it possible to calculate our accuracy? Do you guys think it is? I mean, a couple of people here are nodding. Yeah. Most people say yes. Um, and then the, the final question I want you guys to all think about where, wherever you are is, do you know how accurate you are? No. Oh. So, so everyone said uh, no here at Sutherland to this question, do you know how accurate you are? Which I find strange because you've all said that it's important to be accurate, that it's important to know how accurate you are, and that it's possible to know how accurate you are, but you don't know it. And then I'd like you to ask yourself this one final question, which is, are you more accurate than a monkey guessing at random? So some people have said yes, and a couple of people have said probably not, uh, <laughs> which I guess is reflective of everyone's kind of self-perception. So the, the idea of the monkey guessing at random is not a new one, and it, there's a lot of fields where the, the monkey making random guesses is is uh, used as an analogy the, one of the earliest ones was in the stock market where basically um the the question was uh, are professional stock pickers better than a monkey throwing darts at the financial page of a newspaper and the answer to this question is actually no so there are quite a few fields of life where blindfolded monkey throwing darts are better than supposedly intelligent humans and one of the people that got me thinking about this the most was this guy, Hans Rosling, who wrote this amazing book called Factfulness, which I recommend to all of you. And he asked uh, people, mainly professionals, academics and politicians, a whole bunch of questions about the world. Things like, um, you know, where does the population live? How much money do they earn? And found that not only were people wrong about a lot of questions about basic facts about the world, but they were systematically worse than someone just making random guesses. And they actually quantified this to, to say that actually the monkey is not just better than average, but is way better than average. And most people are substantially worse than um, monkeys making random guesses. So I'd like you now to just think about how, whether this applies to you in medicine. So I'd like you to just all consider this scenario. So you see, you're in the ED, you're working, say it's a, a normal evening shift, and you see a 55 year old man presenting with central chest pain for the last 24 hours, and a basically normal examination, normal looking ECG, and a first troponin of 12, so, so normal first troponin. And you look at your guideline, um, the New South Wales Paxa, yeah, and it says you always need to take two troponins, um, but you think that actually one troponin is enough. And and so the the next question is, what does that say about you? So does it mean that you understand that because the pain's been ongoing for twenty four hours, there would have been a trop leak by now, and therefore it's safe to send this person home? That is the usual kind of rationale for for this kind of uh, decision. Uh, or does it mean you think you're more knowledgeable than the clinicians at the CEC who devised the pathway? And even though the committee examined more than 300 primary research papers and 23 New South Wales adverse clinical incidents, you're going to ignore the guideline. Because the guideline doesn't have do just one troponin anywhere in it. There's, no, there's nothing in that that says it's okay to do one. So what I would argue in this situation is that even if you think the left is, the left hand side is true, the right, it still your decision still implies that the right hand side is true as well. So even if you have a good rationale, there's still an implication that you think you know better than a guideline made by a consensus of experts. And this kind of got me thinking about, um, you know, when we do this, how valid is that behavior? How, how good are we at actually assessing patients? And there, there aren't many papers that just assess diagnostic accuracy across all problems, but there are some quite good ones on specific problems. And I thought I'd focus on 
uh, acute coronary syndrome first because it's one of the most common presentations we see. So there was this paper that came out of uh, uh, the UK, um, some clinicians at Manchester Royal Infirmary, they looked at about 1400 patients with uh, suspected acute coronary syndrome and then the emergency physicians there were asked to state the likelihood of acute coronary syndrome based on the clinical assessment. So the question is how accurate is a clinical gestalt to rule out an acute coronary syndrome? And it turns out that when emergency physicians were, were pretty sure that there was no chance of a, acute coronary syndrome, they were quite accurate in that thought. They had a sensitivity of 98% and they, they hardly missed anything. But they only had that level of certainty with a, a very small proportion of the patients they saw. Far more of the time they, they actually felt that the best they could say was that it was probably not acute coronary syndrome. And this applied to about 30% of the presentations. The remaining presentations were either probably or definitely. Um, and so the sensitivity dropped to about 86% when you include all these people. So actually the, the bulk of the people who either probably not or definitely not um, ACS um, would result in quite a lot of missed cases because you, your sensitivity drops quite a lot. So the, in this case, at least, it's probably important to use more than just a clinical gestalt. And the question of can we measure accuracy uh, has been around for a while. And one of the uh, one of the methods for doing it has come from uh, weather forecasters. So we all know that weather forecasters like to say there's a 50 percent chance of rain or the 70 percent chance of rain. And you know, it turns out a lot of people don't know what that means when they see a, a weather forecast. But what it should mean is that if you had 100 days like that on 50 of them, there would be rain. So you can use all these numerical predictions to come up with these scores called Briar scores. And I'm going to explain that to you now, and then I'm going to apply it to um, my own clinical practice. So let's say you're a weather forecaster and you predict a 70% chance of rain. So your probability of rain is 0.7. And then let's say it rains. So the outcome is assigned either a one or a zero. And then the, you compare the number from the outcome, I1, with the number that you gave in terms of probability. So, and then the, the, the bigger the difference, the worse it is. Um, so, and the way you actually convert this into a score is you subtract one from the other and square it. So in this case, you predicted 70% uh, chance of rain. The, it did rain, and so you get a 0 0.3 squared, which is 0 0.09. So the worst score you can get is one, and the best score you can get is zero. So just to, to work this through, let's say you're an amazing predictor of weather and you said, okay, there's a 90% chance of rain, and then it did rain, that gives you a bias score of 0 0.01. But let's say you're an incompetent fool, and you say there's only 10% chance of rain, but actually it was very likely to rain, and then it rains, you get a high bias score of 0 0.81. Okay, so, uh, and, and if you say a weatherman is saying there's 20% chance of, of rain, and let's just say we've got two weather forecasters, and let's say we've got our perfect predictor, and she gives a 20% chance of rain for all the days which correctly have a 20% chance of rain. So out of five days, we'd end up with one rainy day, the other four not, and um, she has correctly identified that there is um, one in five rainy days. Um, so her Briar scores, she gets generally low scores. There's one day where it does rain and she had only predicted 20%, but on average, her score is pretty good. But our incompetent fool just makes much more random guesses, kind of gives random probabilities. And you can see they end up with a um, much higher scores of, of 0.33. So I started doing this uh, myself with uh, scans. So it, for, for a while, I, I have been doing predictions where every time I see a patient and get a scan, um, I try and make a prediction based on the most likely diagnosis. And I only allow myself one prediction per scan because otherwise you can kind of game the system by making lots of negative predictions about things that, that weren't likely to happen. Um, and I, the reason I chose scans is because they're very good for a bin binary outcome of, you know, did they or did they not have something? So I'm going to do a couple of, I'm going to do my first two cases with you that I started doing this predictions with, and I'm going to get you to kind of in your head, make some predictions, and then we'll see um, what happened. So the first case, an uh, 80 year old woman presented with central abdominal pain and vomiting. Uh, she had actually opened her bowels early that morning, but then since the pain started, hadn't passed stool and hadn't passed any flatus since then. Only background was a cholecystectomy, 
she uh, examined uh, with a lot of tenderness in her abdomen, um, but was hemodynamically normal. Her bowel sounds were, were scant. So I thought, okay, maybe this is small bowel obstruction. And the, the question I want you to, to ask yourself is what is the probability that this woman has an acute small bowel obstruction? And I'll get someone in the room here at Sutherland just to give me a number that they think. Eighty percent. Thirty-five. Fifty-five. Okay. Okay. So we got fifty percent, eighty percent, fifty-five. Any form of small bowel obstruction. So I was actually outrageously confident in my clinical assessment, and I said this is ninety-five percent chance. Uh, this is a small bowel obstruction. Uh, and it was. So, um, yeah, I correctly identified this one and got a very low score for that one. So the next case, a 35-year-old man, presented with gradual onset abdominal pain, initially central, and then became a right eyelet fossa pain. He was tender in the right eyelet fossa, but had no peritonism. Uh, temperature was kind of low-grade temp, 37.8. Other OBS were completely normal. And so I said, okay, well, what's the probability that this man has acute appendicitis? 25 percent don't know what the crp is at this stage 0.95 okay so we've got we've got guesses we've got guesses ranging from 25 percent to 99 percent um which i think reveals the kind of disparity in our in all our clinical practice so i actually uh, also put a 99 percent chance of appendicitis for this one uh, but but actually it wasn't um <laughs> so, so I was definitely overconfident. Yeah, I was uh, horrendously overconfident, arrogant, some might say. Um, yeah, so, so and, and actually this, this guy had diverticulitis and I, I was totally baffled by this because um, I was thinking, oh, you know, he's 35, it's a migratory pain, he's got right eyelet fossa tenderness. I was like, if this is not appendicitis, I don't know anything. And it turns out I, I actually don't know anything. Um, <laughs> So then I decided to, to just collect a bit more data and do a few more predictions. And I came up with a kind of a list of scans that I've done. And I'm not going to make all of you go through all of my cases and uh, see if you come up with the same probabilities that I did. But you can see this, the scans I did were, you know, there's a, there's a big variety of scans, you know, a few CT brains, a few abdomen uh, trauma series, a couple of facial, one facial bones, a CTPA. So all kind of different things um, like, for example, that third one was um, an angio of the circle of Willis um, because someone had come in with sudden onset, um, sudden onset vertigo. So I was trying to predict, you know, what, how, how likely is this to be a kind of posterior circulation deficit? So I'm sure what you all really want to know is how does the doctor do uh, compared to the monkey? And I thought, okay, I'm going to put myself up against this monkey. And so on the one hand, we have me, um, um, postgraduate year six. Um, and that was me on my elective, yeah. Um, it's, I know, it's a, it's a long time ago. Um, so, yeah, that was, that, I've, I've learned a lot since then. There, there was a minor accident on that scooter, and uh, probably will never do that again. Um, but, yeah, so, and I, you know, just to give some context, I, have, I haven't done my exams, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a senior, some of my colleagues, but, but I have done, you know, a few years of training. So, we're going up. so these were all the uh, predictions that I made. And um, you can see that, like, the small bowel obstruction I've got, there was an obvious stroke that I had got, and then most of the other scans were negative. So, and I put a variety of... Um, uh, predictions on it like I was pretty sure that that sudden onset um vertigo because uh, they had a few other they had a non-reassuring hints exam they had kind of decreased coordination on one side I was like oh this is definitely going to be a, a central cause and and actually they didn't see anything on the angiogram maybe so maybe you needed an MRI that's what I told myself uh, anyway <laughs> so all of this basically gave me an, an average uh, Briar score of 0 0.12 and the next question is, how does the, the dart throw a monkey do? So, so what happens when a, a monkey choosing completely at random tries to do the same thing? And 
this is the thing, right? A dark phone monkey just chooses at random. So you can essentially say that they have a 50% chance of choosing yes or no for every single uh, station. And uh, so you give them a, a, a prediction of 0.5 for all of them, and that gives them a bias score of 0.25. So their average bias score is 0.25, um, which means that my score was quite a lot better than the monkey score. And I thought, well, this is good. I'm better than a monkey. Um, so I at least managed to justify my role in the department. But then I started thinking a bit more about this, this monkey, thinking, OK, well, I've defeated the monkey, but um, is, is it really enough to just stop comparing myself to this monkey? And then I thought, well, I sort of set myself up a bit of a straw man argument because uh, trying to score better than someone who just guesses yes or no randomly for everything is, is a pretty low bar to set myself. And I thought, well, is there anyone that I could compare myself to that would be slightly better, but still a monkey. And so I thought about this uh, other character that I could compare myself to, which is the depressed monkey. And the depressed monkey, you can see, is looking sad. And he, the, the depressed monkey has an overwhelmingly negative outlook on life. So when a depressed monkey uh, is given a yes or no choice, he always chooses uh, no. So th this is the characteristic of the depressed monkey. So, so instead of a monkey that just randomly chooses yes or no, this is just a monkey that always throws the dart at the no side and you always just get a, a, a no answer. So I thought, okay, well, I'll compare myself doctor against depressed monkey. This is probably a fairer challenge. And so how does the depressed monkey do? Well, the depressed monkey actually does quite a lot better because... Um, the monkey just predicts a 0% chance for all the diagnoses that uh, he thinks about. And so he misses the small bowel obstruction completely and he misses the obvious stroke. But on all of the other scans, he correctly identifies uh, that there was no pathology. And so the monkey scores 0 0.13. He does kill a couple of people, but his diagnostic, his diagnostic accuracy is is only marginally different from a trained medical professional. Um, and the, the fact is here that, that I did win, but um, I only just beat the monkey. Doesn't this show um, an issue with the Briar score rather than your clinical score? I, I don't know, actually. Um, I'm not it's sure what it shows. It's it's not an it is not. Well, it is and it isn't, though, because, I mean, you, you, sure, so someone, I don't know if you guys could hear, but so, someone in the room here at Sutherland has said that the, the problem must be with the score, not me, uh, which is very flattering. Um, someone else has said it's both me and the score. Um, but I, I think the interesting thing is that it's very easy to say, oh, okay, well, this this score is nonsense, so there's no point doing it. But the, the alternative is to just say, I'm just not going to measure my accuracy at all, and I'm going to be blissfully ignorant. Which, which I kind of got to thinking is not necessarily justified because, you, you know, it is actually important whether or not we're accurate. It's kind of important to know how accurate we are, especially when we start doing things like changing management away from guidelines. Um, I think if you I would really challenge you if you're going to do things differently to guidelines, but you don't know how accurate your own judgment is. I'd really challenge you to think like, what, why are you doing that, and and how can you justify doing that if you, um, you know, if you don't actually know how accurate you are when you make your clinical assessments. The the problem with this is most of our scans are ruled out, not ruled in. So the Bright School. If you can say it's not going to be anything any time, it's always going to be artificial. Yeah, I'll, and I'll accept that. And I'll accept that it's okay to do a lot of scans that turn up negative. But I think the interesting thing about this is not that I did a load of wasted scans that didn't show anything. I think the interesting thing is that my perception of my own judgment of I can guess accurately how likely something is, was vastly different from the reality, which is that I was not that accurate guessing. So I think when you then, I, I totally accept the point that if we're not going to do, that it's still fine to do all of these scans that mainly are negative because we need to rule things out. But I think if you start doing other things based on the fact that you believe that you're a, a kind of competent medical professional who can make assessments, that that logic is fraught with difficulty and danger. But if all your scans are positive, you're missing an awful lot of 
Yeah, you, you you are you are, but the, the the point is not really about the scans. It's about your, your perception of your own accuracy. So, I thought I would uh, do the final bit of this presentation on on things that we can do to improve our diagnostic accuracy and reduce errors. And some of this is taken from uh, medical research, um, particularly about assessments of acute coronary syndrome, and some of it is taken from uh, the. Uh, research by Hans Rosling, the guy who wrote Factfulness, and a little bit is um, is from the kind of thinking fast and slow school of uh, behavioral psychology and economics. So I'm going to uh, end with three things that we can all do to try and improve our own diagnostic accuracy and reduce errors. The first one is take the outside view. What I mean by take the outside view is this. Let's say you see these two patients. One is an 80-year-old woman with a sharp right-sided pain, and the other one is a 35-year-old man with a central heavy chest pain. So there are two conflicting uh, biases here. One is going to be saying, well, the, the bottom one sounds like acute coronary syndrome. That's the inside view. It fits the characteristics of what we know acute coronary syndrome does, central heavy chest pain. The other one is to say any 80-year-old woman has a much higher baseline incidence of acute coronary syndrome than a 30, any 35-year-old man. So regardless of the character of the pain and the other things that make the history more or less likely, I need to be more suspicious um, with uh, the person in the, in the top one. And, and a guy called Philip Tetlock wrote, wrote a book called Super Forecasters about how you can make your predictions better. One of the key things about make, becoming better at predicting things is to take the outside view, i.e. to start with the baseline probability and work off that much more than the individual characteristics of the thing you're seeing in front of you. The next thing uh, I want you to do is, is challenge your thinking. So I want you to, to if you've assessed the patient, ask yourself, how do I know this is the correct diagnosis? Or could I be wrong? Or what would make me wrong about this? Or what are the other things it could be? And I think if you're, if you're um, supervising a junior who comes up and asks you to review a patient or discuss someone with you, you've got to really challenge them to think of something else. So, so say, for example, if I could guarantee you that this wasn't, uh, you, that you were wrong about this diagnosis or that this, this wasn't an acute coronary syndrome, what would your explanation of the patient's symptoms be? And this, the, the function of this behavior is essentially to challenge some of the, the innate biases we have, particularly uh, premature closure and confirmation bias, where we think of a diagnosis and then everything seems to fit with that and we kind of stop thinking about other things too early. So um, challenge your thinking is the, the second thing I want you to, to think about. The third point, and I, this is somewhat controversial in that some people hate guidelines and don't deviate from them, but I, um, if you speak to people who work in the medical legal field, they they will tell you that from a me medical legal point of view, it's much harder to defend yourself um, when you have done something that is, is uh, counter to what an established guideline says. But I think there's more reasons than just medical legal to, to, to stick to guidelines. I think like the, the point that I was making about, say, the cardiology ones with, with PAXA is that guidelines have often been derived from a, a fairly substantial body of evidence that looks at quite a lot of cases. And for you to deviate from that is essentially saying that I think um, my patient doesn't fit into the, the standard mold or algorithm for the guidelines. And the analogy for this is, is something called the broken leg analogy, which is if you were using a, um, uh, an algorithm to predict whether a friend of yours was say, for example, going to the theater on, on Friday or going out to a pub on, on Friday night, and you had an algorithm that told you to do that, but you knew that, that your friend had a broken leg, um, the argument is that you should be able to use the knowledge of your friend's broken leg to inform your decision and you shouldn't have to stick to whatever algorithm you came up with. And, and the problem with this is that we tend to see a lot more broken legs than there really are. So when we see a bunch of patients in a day, we can find something with almost all of them that we think makes them different from what the guidelines are telling us. But actually we potentially do harm by doing that because a lot more people fit into the guidelines. And when you've got a national guideline or at least a regional guideline, you know, it's often quite well evidence-based and you know, they put the guideline there for a reason. I think you've got to be very wary of deviating from it. Um, 
So I think the final thing um, that I really want to say is uh, this quote from Atul Gawande, who's a, an author, an American surgeon, who said, if you care about something, count it. And I, I realized that I cared about my diagnostic accuracy and I had no idea how accurate I was. So I decided to, to try measuring it. And I think measuring it was a really humbling experience for me. Um, it was really interesting to see how inaccurate I was. I, I don't think my practice was necessarily bad, but my actual accuracy of, of giving probabilities to things was abysmally low. And that was a really interesting uh, experience. I really encourage any of you who are interested in knowing this for yourself to, to, to try something similar to, to work it out, even if it's just to keep you humble and, and keep your ego in check, which it certainly has helped me to do. Um, so the take home points for this, for this uh, little presentation uh, is number one, take the outside view and think about baseline probabilities. Number two, challenge your thinking and challenge the thinking of those around you, especially junior colleagues. And number three is we have guidelines for a reason, you've got to be very cautious about deviating from guidelines. So that's it, thank you very much. And um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Tristan, I have a question. It's Kyla again. Thank you for a very interesting and very different approach to the, the, the cases today. Um, do you ever look at your admissions? Sorry, I'm pausing because I can hear myself an echo and it's very off-putting. Um, do you ever think look at your admissions and, and what happens on the admission and to that patient whilst they're discharged to look at your diagnostic accuracy and perhaps give yourself a broader view of how much better or worse than a monkey you are? Um, yeah, the, the answer to that is yes, I do look at it. Uh, I haven't systematically measured it with scores like I did for scans, mainly just because it's, it's a little trickier trying to match up whether you're right or wrong when, you know, let's say you um, assess someone as having like an acute surgical abdomen, you don't specify exactly what you think is wrong. And then the final diagnosis is, uh, you know, contained perforation. It's a little harder to decide whether you were right or wrong about that. Um, I do often read uh, the subsequent um, notes and uh, it, it's clear that some of my inpatient colleagues think that I'm no more accurate than a monkey um, from some of the, <laughs> the notes about my ad admission documentation that I've encountered. Uh, but the answer about whether have I done the same with prior scores and calculating like a number to show whether I'm accurate or not um, is no, I, I haven't uh, done the me versus monkey test um, using inpatient notes. I think it would be interesting to sort of keep a list of them and sort of score one or zero um, because I think we tend to look at the things we got right and go, yes, I nailed that, I'm so good. And the one I didn't, we overbalances it probably a little bit because we tend to be negative about ourselves. But I think it's definitely good to keep it in mind. Yeah, I agree. I think it would be a really interesting thing to do.